Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Classroom Matters podcast with me, your host, Christy Hull. And today, I am delighted to be speaking with our guest, Rose Marie Griffin. Now, Rose is heavily engaged in the field of the art of communication. Rose is both a skilled speech language pathologist, as well as an accomplished behavior analyst. Rose currently works with both public and private school students in Ohio, where she has a focus and passion on helping individuals with autism learn how to become better communicators. With these efforts, Rose has created her own business, a website to assist both professionals, such as special education teachers and speech therapists, as well as parents of children with autism. Her website, abaspeech.org, contains a host of helpful resources consisting of educational courses and therapy materials. Rose, welcome to the Classroom Matters podcast. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we're just going to dive right into our conversation. We were talking, Rose and I were talking before we hit the record button about how we tried to connect before and it didn't work out. And, you know, it's just kind of like a testament to how life is just like that. And it's really been like that for the last couple of years. You have to be flexible, patient, understanding. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and just kind of go with the flow with everything. And I think that that's going to be a really good segue into our conversation with you today as we talk about. Um, you know, students with autism and all of the cool things that uh, resources that you're bringing to light. So if you would not mind, Rose, could you start by just giving our listeners a little bit of your background and sort of your journey to what you're currently doing today? Absolutely. So I became a speech language pathologist. I graduated in 2003. So I've been doing this almost 20 years. So I'm calling myself seasoned. Okay, not old. And um, I really have always loved working with autistic students. That's always been my passion ever since I started doing therapy in graduate school. Um, And I started learning more about um, the field. And about 10 years ago, I completed all my training and supervision, a big test. And I also became a board certified behavior analyst, and there are less than 500 people worldwide who hold both of those certifications. So I really just wanted to be able to reach autistic learners. Um, I had an experience where I was working at the Cleveland Clinic, now it's called Learner School, and I was meeting older students who had autism and they had no way to communicate, and it just really hurt my heart. And I knew that I wanted to do everything to help the students that were hard to help. And so that's just always been my jam. I just have always been, you know, talking about autism, Um, you know, I remember 10 years ago when I started presenting, I would say one in 242, you know, people have autism. And now the CDC just came out with one in 44. So the information that I share is very important because most people either have a loved one in their own family with autism or a neighbor, or a friend, or just seeing somebody in the community. So, you know, that passion just grew. And I started my own business five years ago because I had the idea for a therapy product. Um, I had no idea how to make a therapy product, but I found a, a design a printer. I have distributors. I created a website. And then just the ball started rolling, you know, which has been really exciting. I started my blog and, you know, I have 21,000 followers on Instagram. I even have a TikTok where I talk about autism and do all kinds of fun things over there to share information. And something that I'm very, very proud of besides my courses and consults is um, my podcast called Autism Outreach. It comes out every single Tuesday and it's all about autism in communication. And I just love being able to help people on such a global level. Just today, I had an email from somebody in Italy. I'm here in Ohio. And she attended my webinar this past week all about joint attention and just shared activities with your student. And she said, you know, I'm a teacher. I have an autistic son and I attended your webinar and it gave me so many great ideas. I was just so stressed out about teaching him his numbers and about him communicating. And we really have had so much fun doing the activities that you talked about in your webinar. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is why I'm doing this. I love this so much. Um, And so things like that, knowing that you're touching somebody's life like that is just um, what really lights me up. Yeah. And so it's really interesting. And I want to, as we get into this conversation, uh, peel some of those layers off of some things that you just mentioned and really go a little bit deeper in those. But when you say you graduated in 2003, was that with a master's degree, a bachelor's degree? And what were you doing before that? Because I sort of envision, you know, when you're going through high school um, and you're deciding what you want to do, 
with your life. You know, the next step for a lot of people, not everyone is college and figuring out what they want to do. So I was sort of curious as you were talking, um, are, are, you know, students with autism, is that something that you encountered a lot in high school and your early years? And is that what grew your passion to the point where you wanted to get uh, your educational degree in that? Great question. No, my mom is a retired teacher and she was teaching a career course and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life my senior year of high school. So I took a career assessment and it said speech therapist and I did not ever have speech therapy. I didn't know anything about speech therapy. Nobody in my family ever had speech therapy. So I shadowed a family friend who was a speech therapist and she worked in a nursing home. We did home health. We worked at a school and I thought, wow, this is absolutely amazing. And then I just, ever since I started taking classes, I just knew this was for me. I really started wanting to help autistic learners when I had my, I was in my undergrad, last year of undergrad. So you start doing this like student teaching placement, or maybe it was graduate school. I think it was graduate school, my first year of graduate school. And so I was shadowing a school-based speech therapist and she was working in a regular public school and she had a lot of autistic students who had behavioral challenges, who were not yet speaking, were very much emergent communicators. And those were my favorite kids to work with. I just loved it. I loved creating materials for them. I loved running the groups and seeing their progress was just so amazing to me. And that's really what led me on this passion of, of helping autistic students students find their voice. Yeah, that's a great story. And I'm, and I'm so glad that, that we were able to uncover that because I think a lot of times with professionals and highly um, skilled and experienced folks like yourself, we sort of skim over that just to what you're doing and how you can help people now. But I think that it's important to you know, for our listeners to know and understand that where how that passion grew in you. And I think that's so interesting. I was kind of getting goosebumps when you were talking about how you, you know, you did the interest survey and you had never done that before and you just started doing it and you just start, fell in love with this. Um, because I think it's really important too for kids, seniors and, and those, those young adolescents that are trying to find their way. It might be something that you have never thought about before. Oh, right. um, like with you, yeah. right? it's not, it's not something because, you know, majority of, of people are like, oh yeah, I went to school and I've always wanted to be a teacher. I always, you know, I, right. I have these folks in my family and I wanted to help. So I think it's such a great story that you sort of came into this with no experience. And no, right. It's just like, wow, I guess I'll try it. <laughs> oh yeah. That's it. Never look back. So I want to kind of start by um, talking about autism itself. And so I, you know, we are probably not the same age. We might be somewhat close, but you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I was in high school and starting out, autism was not something that was as upfront as it is today. Um, I can't remember even hearing about that or knowing um, any students that I went to school with that had that diagnosis. But now, you know, it's, it's very common. It's, you know, most everyone, like you said, knows someone or has someone or, or has someone in their life that is autistic. And so talk to our listeners a little bit about what that means exactly and how that has sort of changed um, over the last 10 years. Yeah, I don't know if it's because the way that students were educated when we were probably in school is very different. You know, now students are, you know, included in classes and there's a push to make sure that students are, you know, accessing the general curriculum. And so that might be a difference too, because I don't remember, I remember kids in my high school or, you know, schooling who had physical disabilities, but I don't remember really seeing students with special needs. And I'm just not sure why. And I just went to a public school. I'm sure they were there, you know, but maybe they weren't as fully included as they are now. So I think that might just be, you know, the change. And now, you know, I think what's great with autism community is that, you know, you know, I have students who do have autism, but they really excel in maybe, you know, math or some type of academic um, pursuit. And so they may have some demonstrate some characteristics of autism, like self-stimulatory behaviors or, you know, something like that. But I think this moment now in the autism community is very, you know, you know, I have autism. This is me. Nobody's trying to change you. Um, you know, obviously every person with autism and not everybody, but is going to need some type of support. Um, I'm not sure if you know who Dr. Kerry Magro is, but he is a really phenomenal person. He does have autism, but he said, you know, he did a keynote for this, um, conference that I put on called the ABA forum. And he said, you know, some people have disabilities and they're hidden because here he is a PhD. He's a public speaker. That's how he makes his living. And when he was four, he was 
was not really speaking in full sentences and really had a lot of sensory struggles. And he said, some disabilities are hidden and you can't see the type of support that maybe I need because, you know, I'm talking to you, conversing, I'm on a stage in front of thousands of people. Um, so really it just is a spectrum and everybody may differ in the level of support that they, that they need or, or want. Mm-hmm. What are some of the, the early signs um, that, you know, parents can look for. And I know, you know, that, that in, in our situation, you know, my youngest son is, is autistic. And sometimes I, when I look back on that, I, it took me a while to figure that out because right. some of the signs looked just like normal, you know, developmental, um, milestones or stages. And I wasn't really sure. And so, um, what are some of the early signs that, that parents can really be looking for? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if your child is not yet speaking, usually, you know, roughly and the CDC just changed some milestones, which is, you know, all the speech therapists are kind of, you know, um, a little upset about because we feel like they didn't ask anybody that was a speech <laughs> therapist. But, um, bef- but you know, like usually by one, kids are saying one word, you know, usually by two, they're saying two words. And um, there's a really great website called Autism Navigator, and it has different characteristics of autism. Um, so, you know, not making eye contact is definitely a big one. Um, not responding to your name when your name is called, and just kind of that overall kind of delay, and and kind of like this idea of you know being in your own world where you know you may have a kid and you give them some some cars and some things, and you know maybe they're you know that classic kind of like lining them up. They're playing with things maybe a way that no other kids are playing with it that way because it just makes sense to the, do it that way, and not to say there's anything wrong with that. But those are definitely some characteristics, and I always say you know you have to trust your your mom or dad gut and, you know, your pediatrician or family, you know, don't, don't listen to what everybody says. They may say, oh, it's fine. He's going to start, you know, you have to do your own research. You need to get your child, you know, evaluated if they're under three, you know, through, um, providers. Once a child is going to be three, then your public school district will do an evaluation, um, for free, but you really just have to go out there and advocate for your, for your child and try to help them get the support that they need. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just as important that, that, you know, parents as teachers groups and early preschool teachers, you know, are also trained on some of the early signs, um, of children with autism because the parents may not always see that. And it might be the teachers or the preschool teacher or the daycare workers responsibility to say, Hey, I've noticed some of these things with your child, you know, at age two, three, let's sit down and talk about that. Are there any resources that we can look at? Um, and so talking about resources, um, you are a, a preschool teacher, a parent, and you've noticed some of these signs. I know that you currently have um, a couple of different re- modules, um, mm-hmm. courses that folks can take all the way going, going all the way back to preschool, right? So with your yeah. preschool course, start communicating today. Let's just start there. What are teachers and parents going to find if they're listening to this and saying, okay, yes, I've got some kiddos in my life. I feel that this might be something I need to really start looking into. What kinds of things are they going to find in your courses? Absolutely. So Start Communicating Today is great for parents, educators, working with toddlers and preschool age students who are not yet speaking or speaking in a limited way. So we talk a lot about, you know, what are the foundational skills that you can work on as a parent? You know, because oftentimes what happens for parents is either number one, they're just kind of like not sure, right? They're like, well, could it be? I don't know. What's going on here? Well, I talked to so-and-so and they said, don't worry about it. They'll grow out of it. You know, something like that. Um, Um, And so it, or you might be talking to your pediatrician and then you might be talking to a specialist and then you get put on a wait list, right? And we know that idea with early intervention is I called it start communicating today um, because that's really what we want for our children. We want to support them. You know, we don't want a two-year-old to be, uh, have no way to communicate and to get really upset in the home environment, to have a lot of behavioral barriers because they can't tell you what they want when they're at the store or maybe they're hungry, but they can't tell you that. So it helps you understand what are these foundational skills and what can I start doing now, right, this very moment and what types of activities can we do so that my child is going to engage in these shared activities activities, which we talk about a lot. The jargon term is joint attention, but it just means we're doing something together. Um, That's going to be a foundation for communicating and a foundation for more advanced communication. And so it's going to help you feel really supported in how to help your child have a voice. 
Yeah. And do you see a lot of resistance or a lot of divide in families? Because you've mentioned a couple of times, and we dealt with this a little bit as a family as well. Well, you'll have some folks saying, oh, he'll grow out of it. He'll be fine. You know, just treat him like, you know, you would any other kid and hold him to the same and he'll come around and all those things. And so I know sometimes people can, you know, there can be a division within families even Mm -hmm. um, when you have a child with autism, whether they're diagnosed or undiagnosed. And so have you come across that a lot? And how do you sort of help navigate um, families through that when you have maybe the mom saying, okay, I know my child really needs help. We need to go seek this early intervention. And maybe you have the dad or the grandparent saying, no, this is silly. He's fine. Don't put a label on him if he doesn't need it and all those things. How do you help folks that are in that situation? I really don't deal with that a whole lot just because when people contact me, they are very laser focused on helping their child. So they've either they've either seen a course that I've taught or they've seen, you know, another mom contacted me on Instagram this week and said, um, I found your TikTok and I, you know, I have an older son because I work with middle school, high school students three days a week. So I'm very passionate about helping that age group too. And, you know, she said he's in a vocational program and he's just not making a lot of, of progress progress, you know, could I talk to you? Um, so the people that really contact me are very laser focused on getting help. So I really don't have a whole lot of that kind of rift, but what I always try to do, you know, in a public school, sometimes you see that, but I really haven't, um, is I just try to model and talk about what I'm doing, how it's helping and what progress the student is making. And I feel like it's hard to argue with data. You know, when we take really good data and we show that data in progress notes or in IEP meetings and we talk with parents and and the IEP team, um, it's hard to argue with science and data. Yeah. Yeah. And on top of that, the progress that you can probably show with... Um, just, you know, a, a child's behavior or the progress that they may see within their own child after just a few, applying a few strategies or going and taking, a, you know, a couple of modules of your course. So I'm sure that's helpful too. Um, so what would be some of the strategies, right? So let's say I come to you and I say, oh, you know, my, my child's not communicating. They've been diagnosed with autism. I, you know, I've tried a couple of things without giving the courses away because I, I know <laughs> yeah. people are going to want to go investigate <laughs> yeah. that themselves. But what are ways that parents can help their child learn to communicate better. Yeah. If you have a young child, something that I really talk a lot about is joint attention. And so it's this idea that we're doing an activity together and we both know that we're doing it together. And so we can work on this by using books, by using songs, and by using toys. So, you know, I have a book that I really love. It's called Pete the Cat and His White Shoes. I think a lot of people know that book. It's very engaging. You know, when you're reading a book with your child, you know, you don't want to make it seem like work. You don't want to, this is what you don't want to do. You don't want to say, okay, we're going to read a book now. Come sit with mommy. Come sit down now. Okay, it's time to sit. Because that's what a lot of people do. They think, okay, we're doing this. You're sitting, you're attending the entire time. You know, if your child is not attending at all, you just want to kind of introduce the activity. And then you want to see over time that the amount that they're sitting with you or they're attending to the page or pointing or saying, oh, no, which is a repetitive line in the book, is going to grow over time. So you just want to kind of think about embedding, what can I embed into my daily routine that's not you know, it's number one, not going to make me crazy as a parent because I have three kids of my own. So I get it. And we're all working and we're, we're frazzled. And number two, it's going to help my child. So books are really great. Songs, you know, Wheels on the Bus is super fun because it has motions and the child can imitate it after you. And then also playing, playing with toys, letting learners play with toys the way that they like, kind of observing how they like to play and not overriding that. Um, another little quick strategy I like to do is play modified Simon Says. So the way that we modify that game is that it's always Simon Says. And so it's a shared activity, but we're also working on something together and we're working on imitation too, which is one of the foundational skills that I talk about in the course. Yeah. And so I think too, and, and I don't, I don't know if you, if you talk to parents a lot about this, but sometimes because in our society, we're so used to, if their kid's not looking at you, if they're not speaking back to you, if they're not engaged, then they must not be listening. They must not be paying attention. They must not, you know, retaining 
But what I've noticed is when I, with my child and other children um, in the educational field is my son could not look at me one time. He could act like he's not interested at all. But two days later, he's talking about the book. He knows about the book. He remembers everything that was happening, even though he didn't come across in the moment as being engaged. And so is that something that you find too, that children with autism are highly re retain things that you may think they're not even paying attention to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have some older students that, you know, I mean, number one, working on eye contact is is very poo-pooed, you know, like people in the autism society community have said, like, it's, it's hard for me to make eye contact. Like it actually is painful. So I would say if you're a provider and you're listening, please don't set any goals for eye contact. Um, but number two, it's like, I do a lot of parent coaching. So for my private practice, I just see a handful of kids cause I'm busy doing a lot of, uh, you know, other work in the autism community. But, you know, I talk to parents and say like, it's okay. Like I can't make your child communicate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up some really activities that I think your child would love and enjoy <laughs> and activities that they're going to want to communicate during. Um, but we can never make a learner communicate. So we really don't want to have these shared activities. We don't want to call it work. It doesn't have to be at the table. I'm not saying doing something at the table is the worst thing, but if your child's two, you know, two-year-olds in the table they don't really go. You know what I mean? So, you know, I have a kid I see every Friday morning when we're taping this and he is going to be in kindergarten in two years. So, you know, I'd say 95% of his session is very unstructured and kind of like, you know, I structure it, but it's more child led. And then 5% is, is at the table using flashcards. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the ratio that I use. You have to know your learner and you have to be yeah. really just in tune with your learner's behavior and what's going on in the session. I think sometimes, especially as school-based clinicians, we're so stressed about some parent that called that was mad about something or some IEP or some report that's past due that sometimes we lose sight of the joy of therapy. That's why I really love kind of my private practice because I'm choosing to work with these clients. And so um, it's really my biggest joy. And a huge part of what I do is talking with parents and coaching parents. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure with those sessions and with all of the coaching and the information that you're giving out, even just the small things you just mentioned, um, I'm sure people are like, I didn't think of that. You know, it might even be the simplest things that, but they don't think about, you know, you don't know what you don't know until someone says, and then you're like, you know, the light bulb goes on over their head and they're like, oh my gosh, I, I really never thought of it that way. So you talked about the one big don't, which is, you know, don't make a goal of making your, making the child have eye contact goals. What are some other really big don'ts um, when you're yeah. working with children with autism? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. So, you know, obviously there's, you know, there's an idea of the neurodiversity movement, which, you know, I've had a lot of autistic adults on my podcast. So, you know, autistic adults who don't do ABA, who do floor time, which is kind of very different than ABA kind of. Um, and also autistic adults, you know, I had one guy on Jared Stewart, really smart. He's autistic and he um, is a BCBA. So, you know, just run of the mill, everybody. Um, and so some things that I have picked up is that, you, you know, you should, if you're using you know, we used to be taught in graduate school, say student with autism. It has to be person first. But, you know, a lot of people, and I don't want to say everyone in the autism community, but a lot of people are saying that we should say autistic. We should say, I work with autistic students. I work with autistic learners. Now, I do say phrases like that because I have an online business. <laughs> so I talk about those right. things all the time. You know, if you don't, you would just obviously use the child's name, which is totally fine. Um, another thing is if you're working on social skills, you know, think about why you're working on it. You know, there's this idea of masking where we don't want somebody to feel like they can't be their true selves because that could cause a lot of anxiety, which makes a lot of sense, you know, which makes a lot of sense. So I've had uh, Robin Resigno, who is an autistic adult, and she's a female and she's raising an autistic child. She's getting her, I think maybe she has her PhD now, but she talked about that idea and social skills and just being really cognizant of why are we working on this? How is this going to serve the learner in the long run? Um, because Jared Stewart, the autistic BCBA, he said, you know, I call it camouflaging. So, you know, he said, sometimes when I'm in a group of people, you know, I might not being my most authentic self, but for him, he didn't, he said, sometimes I call that camouflaging. So, you know, everybody's going to have their own opinion is what it is. And that's the thing. People are extremely opinionated, especially online about what they believe in. So, you know, just, you know, don't spend too much time on social media. Um, and then the only other thing is, you know, using the term red flags is very much, well, there's two more. Red flags is very bad. So we would say characteristics of autism. We wouldn't say red flags because that obviously sounds very negative. And um, we don't want to say high functioning, low functioning. 
that's really, really bad. And, you know, these are just things that have come up in our, you know, what we say as, as professionals. And so people are like, well, what do I say instead? So kind of what I've learned from people on the podcast is, you know, if there's a student who's not yet speaking, who really has a lot of behavioral barriers, we may say that student has high support needs. That's more preferred is what I've gathered. Mm-hmm. And I love that you brought that up because um, this has been a conversation that I've been wrapped into over the last few months with that change, high functioning, low functioning, and the right way to say things. And I think that it's it's great that um, folks like yourself are really uh, educating. Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of times parents, teachers, um, people that aren't in the profession or in the world that you're in, they just don't know that. And they're so used to that is being said, you know, he's high functioning, he's low functioning. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, to rephrase it like that, I think is so, is so, uh, much more beneficial when describing the characteristics of your child. And so, um, you know, there's just different, and, and you know, there's different levels of everything everywhere, regardless of what characteristics you have or don't have. I right, that's true for OCD, and that's true mm-hmm. for language, and that's true for whatever. I mean, I'm really OCD. I don't know what the technical <laughs> term for is that, <laughs> right? <laughs> More right. so than most. Um, right. And so, you know, I just I think that that applies to so many things, and I, I appreciate and love the fact that you and so many others are educating folks. Um, on the really the the terminology, the vocabulary, and not only that, but how to then help provide them supports that they need to overcome some of these challenges. Um, so, in that same vein, what are some things on your website um, that if folks go to abaspeech.org that they're going to find and that you offer and provide for educators and families? Absolutely. So we have a blog and every single week we have a new blog that comes out with really great information. We just did one that had a free literacy companion for Brown Bear, Brown Bear, which is a really popular book. So you can always go and search it on my blog, Brown Bear, Brown Bear. Um, For educators, my number one best selling, no, it's not selling, it's free. This is actually free. It's called the Autism IEP Goal Bank. I've had about 15,000 people uh, download this particular download um, as a way to get started in thinking about IEP goals for students who are not yet speaking because sometimes what happens is students don't complete an assessment because they're not engaging. They won't sit and it's hard and then it's hard to know what to work on and then you're like sitting down to write your IEP and you know, you're freaking out a bit, to be honest. So that's been really popular. Um, And we also have the podcast. So we also gather video and audio for our podcast. And every single Tuesday, we have a new episode that airs. Um, We just did one with um, a mom who has an autistic child, and she's also a speech therapist. So she kind of shared all of her her great input. And then we also have the courses, Start Communicating Today. And then we have one for school-age students called Help Me Find My Voice. Um, And that's a really great course. I had a mom, uh, Rebecca Shalita, she took my course and was on my podcast and her son was in apply ABA applied behavior analysis she he was getting some services and she said you know Rose your course really helped me feel more comfortable with what what they were even talking about because it's a whole kind of learning curve sometimes um, when you get into the world of ABA and so those can be a resource and support um, and a guide for you on this autism journey mm-hmm. And you mentioned being on TikTok. And so then I assume that you are also, I'm impressed by that. I mean, it's- Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I April 2020, me and the kids started a, a family account. And then I was like, okay. I think June 2020 is when I started um, it for ABA speech. So it's been super fun. I was actually just on my business mentor, um, Pat Flynn's podcast called Smart Passive Income, talking about how I use TikTok for my small business, which was a highlight for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's awesome because you have to keep up. You really do. I mean, and it's going so (laughs) fast and I know you have other children and you work with kids and I have three teenagers in my house and I'm like, I don't even understand. I I mean, trying to, to keep up with what every generation is doing on social media, but, um, so we can find you on TikTok. We can find you at your website and I'm assuming Instagram and Facebook as well. Oh yeah. Instagram is my jam. ABA speech by Rose. That is my Instagram. I post daily on there. I do stories. I talk about, you know, what's a sneak behind my therapy room and, and I do reels. So I'm not saying I'm dancing every day on there, but there, there are some dance moves I'm busting out at times. (laughs) 
I can't wait to watch it myself. <laughs> um, and so for all of our listeners, as as you know, always, my listeners, um, we will post all of Rose's info, her links, her website, everything at the click of a button on the description page once this episode is released. So no need to be trying to write all of this down if you're you know, listening and you're really excited about all of these really cool resources from Rose. So thank you so much for being here. As I'm so delighted and excited for all of the, the things that you're doing and educating folks and supporting folks um, with, with children that are struggling right now and really helping them ease their anxiety, ease their stress, giving them answers that they may not be able to find elsewhere from a kind, compassionate, experienced voice um, like yours. So thank you so much for being with us on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. It was great to connect. And again, we will post all of Rose's information on our description page, um, everywhere that you're able to access this podcast. And also don't forget to go and check out all of our new resources on the educate.today website.